Hey folks, it's Marvin Cash, the host of The Articulate Fly, and we're back with another East Tennessee Fishing Report with Ellis Ward. How are you doing, Ellis? I am doing well, Marv. How are you? As always, I'm just trying to uh, stay out of trouble, and we were talking before we started recording, and it sounds like uh, conditions in your neck of the woods have been a little bit challenging lately. Yeah, as, as much as I think everyone, especially guys, want to say that fishing's always good, uh, the, the midday lulls have been very present and a lot of it has to do with just full sun and low water. The, there's limited bug activity and, you know, it, it can be warm and a great quote unquote, great day to be out as, as some people say, but a bad fishing day. It's, you know, high pressure. There's some wind. Uh, there's a lot of wind in, in the last few days. And it really, bugs don't like to come out. And this will be, you know, the, in saltwater, having having minnows present means that there's going to be fish that are going to eat the minnows and then bigger fish that are going to eat those fish that eat the minnows. So on the trout stream, when the bugs come out, that's our minnows. And that, that create a, a chain reaction of feeding activity and without those, I mean, you, you can still you can still get them going, but that that to me is typically going to be in generation where you have a lot of other stuff happening. So we're we're getting some pushes of water recently, um, in, in the last couple of days, and then actually today, tomorrow, and um, the following day, it looks like we're getting a lot of water on, on the Wataga. Uh, that that said, every guide boat has been on the Wataga, and and most of the the folks putting out, you know, twenty thirty guide boats are all fishing the upper portion of the Wataga because the South Holston is just not generating, so there isn't enough water to float. So that you can't ignore the impact that all those boats have on on fishing. So all that said. There have been some awesome fishing moments and, and hours, and they are generally in the the first and last light, you know, two or three hours before, um, or I, sh- I should say two or three hours after sunrise and, and before sunset. Um, and then the caddis, can, it, it can be a tough hatch to try to crack, especially when they're eating on top. Um, I'm going to be putting out a video where I'll, I'll talk at length on that one. Um, but I would encourage a lot of movement on your flies and, um, not being afraid to really experiment with the, the types of pattern you're fishing, recognizing that a caddis pupa does not look like an elk hair caddis. And, uh, lastly, I'll say that the, uh, the mayflies are are starting to, you know, they've, they've been going, but it's it's kind of tough to pattern right now. They aren't really in a cycle, but they are starting to come out in numbers. And just with the amount of food via bugs on the surface that have that's been present to the fish in the last few weeks, you know, fish and dries and fish and dry droppers and not really need to go down super far they're used to seeing things on the surface so they're they're more willing to come up and um you know f- fish in a dry or a dry dropper blindly especially when things are tough and you, you're not picking anything up on whatever you're doing um start doing some things like that and you, you'll you'll pick up some fish doing some in a fishy looking zone, just, just fishing a dry on its own or fishing a dry dropper. Yeah, got it. And got an interesting question for you from James and he's been following you. And I think this is the, well, I know this is related to one of your videos and he basically, if you break the question down, I think you were talking about uh, fishing uh, hair bugs and how to get them to swim properly. Um, but then kind of a related question to that was, I guess there's some instances where you actually like a smaller weighted pattern uh, with a shorter tail. And James wanted you to kind of expound on that a little bit. Yeah. And as we discussed, it's 
between an eight and 12 hour conversation, depending how long I'll talk about that all day on my boat. And as we come up to different waters and I'm dropping anchor and switching flies. Now I, I had one person ask me, do you always change flies this often? And of course my answer was not simple, but it, it was basically getting to James's question, which, which is that if I have an angler that's, that's capable and that is able to generate the the action on on different sets of flies and make the casts with different setups then i'm going to change every time we're in different water it doesn't take that long to change out a fly so what i was referring to you know my my decision making process there and i guess i'll caveat that with am i am i absolutely correct no do i think it makes a difference yes and it does make a difference in, in the action of the fly. So if you're if you're fishing, be it wade or or from a or float fishing, and you're in fast water, consistently fast water, it's very hard to get a cast out that results in the fly being in a position where it's moving at the same speed as the line. And so I'll, I'll, I'll use dry fly fishing as an example here. You don't want to cast a dry fly out with a completely straight line at 90 degrees from the boat with the water rushing downstream because it's immediately going to start getting ripped downstream. So you you know that's reach man's. I mean you and you and Mac can talk about that for years. Streamer fish is the same thing. If you want a the hair bugs thrive, or if not, they they are present in your box because they have these giant kills, and because they swim, they don't they don't swim without a a change in pace or a kill. So that that kill being a strip and then a pause, that pause is the kill. If you are fishing in a circumstance where your line is being be it from your casting or from the river setup and bank to bank it's going to be different and 50 yards down one bank it's going to be different than 50 yards upstream if you're fishing in a, a circumstance that your line is getting ripped before you're able to get it completely straight and moving um, at the same speed as the fly then it's time to go to something simpler and uh, you know, another a, a simpler way of stating that is a more uniform, slower current is better for hair bugs or moving at the same speed of the river. So at that point, you're not back rowing um, and, and while you're float fishing, you're, you're moving with the river and that allows you to get a presentation that your your line, everything is moving as though the you're fishing in still water because you're all moving at the same speed. So faster, you know, the, the very simple way to state that is the the faster water with a with your with a tight window, I start going smaller and sinkier. And and I use that jig that's that's the kill. And it's to get a pronounced up and down movement with a jig fly, so something heavy you don't need a tight line and your casting can kind of be sloppy. I, I think that's why they're so effective. Um, if you watch your fly and watch when you get eats and after doing this for, you know, thousands of days now fishing on my own, not just guiding it's, it's on the pause. It's on the kill. It's you'll occasionally get them when you're, when you're moving it. Um, but it's, it's always after it's always after a kill or a pause. And so if you're not able to generate that with the hair fly, then it's time to go to the jig. And then those, those, those open water situations, um, slower water, clearer water, bigger pools, that's where I really like the, the hair bugs. And then, again, that to summarize that, that in-between part of I want to fish hair bugs in fast water, then you either have to stop back rowing 
while you're float fishing and just move at the speed of the river or while you're wade fishing fish up and down the banks in in the little pockets that have absolutely no structure and just recognize that you're not spooking a fish if you're 10 yards downstream you're putting out 20 30 40 foot cast to a little piece of pocket water it that fish is is going to go just as it would from fishing from a boat yeah and i guess too part of it is the understanding that you know kind of the magic of hair bugs is basically the density of the head right and and that's kind of what allows you to do all these great things and get all the great movement but kind of in that progression kind of between hair bugs and jig flies you know if you look at like fishing changers with different head structures to get you know i always think about it as kind of like letting water flow through a screen door right and it's Mm -hmm. very very dense with deer hair so you get a lot of water stoppage right i mean you can time more sparsely but it but they are compared to synthetics right they're just denser and uh, but you know you can have all these things you can do to kind of vary how much water starts to move through the fly which kind of gives you a little bit more versatility too right yeah i mean that changers so there's, there's in my opinion changers are an entirely different set and then there's different sets within that different set but totally different set between hair bugs and and jig flies which are the other two i would say to be very simple the other two categories of of trout flies changers are there's so much i mean you you could be fishing uh a jiggy type changer and and be getting some good action but yeah the 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 density and the the material selection and man i i've I've become a complete nerd on tying those, which I'm, I'm somewhat less vocal about, um, I guess, on social media, but um, trying to get a really good combination of a push and kill and sink rate and still have it be able to, you know, you, you can launch it if you need to, but do it on a six or a seven weight with a profile that that screams six or seven inch fat fish. But yeah, that's, there's there's a lot more going on there and outside of the material selection that like you said that head density and material selection combined with i spend a lot of time focusing on the tail and and how that affects swim and um yeah that's that's it's a very thoughtful fly especially when you're thinking about the different situations that you'd like to be fishing in yeah well, James, I hope that helps. I mean, I think um, I almost opened Pandora's box when we started talking about changers, but um, <laughs> we could talk about it forever. But I, I would say, you know, the only reason I wanted to bring it up is I think it's important to kind of understand the kind of the hydro the hydrodynamics, right? Because that will, you know, is like, you know, LSU and I talk about all the time. If you start to understand why, then you can start to solve a lot of yeah. these problems yourself, right? So. You know, if you need a pattern that, um, you know, has a little, lets a little bit more water flow through it because you need to fish it in a different way, um, just kind of something to kind of file away. But, uh, James, if we didn't hit it, hit us back. And, um, you know, folks, we love questions on the Articulate Fly. You can email them to us. You can DM us on social media. If we use your question, I will send you some Articulate Fly swag. We are drawing for two days of fishing with Ellis and a night at the Watauga River Lodge and Ellis, before I let you go, you want to let folks know where they can find you so they can book you and fish with you? Yes, sir. Uh, website is elliswardfishing.com. It's also elliswardflies.com. And Instagram is elliswardguides. And the best way to reach me, contact me, ask me about the color of the caddis you should be fishing or swim flies versus jig flies anything um between that and and booking a trip with me is my cell phone at 513-543-0019 well there you go well folks you owe it to yourself to get out there and catch a few tight lines everybody tight lines ellis appreciate it marv